Uh, my name is Alex Walker. I'm the CEO of East Star Resources, and we are a London listed company focused on exploring for uh, copper, for rare earths, and for gold in Kazakhstan. Alex, uh, good to be talking to you again. It's the first time we've spoken on Crux, and I haven't actually seen you for many years, but we, we crossed paths in London. And now you're th there in uh, Central Asia, in, in um, Alma Ata, Almaty, you know, the, 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 the father of. Uh, of apples, I think that's what it means, isn't it? Yeah, the father of the apple. Um, how was the yeah, apple? Yeah, absolutely, thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. We're uh, we're enjoying our cider, um, <laughs> uh, and they are they're even starting to make decent wine here in in Elmarchi as well. So, yeah, honestly, it's a, it's a absolutely wonderful place to live. For I'm sure some some of your um, uh, listeners will will know. I moved here about a year and a half ago with with my wife and uh, and two young children, and. Um, yeah, we're ha we're having an absolutely fantastic time, both uh, both socially, enjoying the environment, and also obviously operationally as well. Uh, when I was last there about fourteen years ago, it was greatly changed to when I was first there about twenty years ago, and uh, it was it was feeling quite vibrant. Uh, I, I had a day skiing up in the mountains just outside um, Almaty. Um, it was a, it was a pretty interesting place, actually. You know, I skied twenty years ago. Um, and I came back about 14 years, and the the the, the city was um, was greatly changed from 2003 to 2009. Yeah, look, I think um, there's been so much investment that's gone on. You know, it, it, it's it's very similar to um, to Perth uh, from West Australia in many ways, and that it's um you know it's such a resource rich and 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 focused country. Um, principally, Kazakhstan, uh, you know, made the vast majority of its wealth from from um, fossil fuels, from oil and gas. And it's something that strategically they're trying to, to wean themselves off um, today as well. But uh, obviously with oil booms and so on, uh, quite a significant amount of investment has, uh, has, has come into the place. And Almaty is, is a hugely vibrant city. I mean, you, you drive around town and you're not short of restaurants to choose from, you know, giant buildings. Um, uh, you know, it looks and it's just, just on, the, on, the, on the cusp of, um, of the mountains where you skied. Actually, Shimbalak is the, the place where people go and it's 20 minutes and about a four dollar cab ride to um to the base of the ski lift, which is uh, which is quite pleasant. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a, really is a fantastic place to be, and and you know very secure, wonderful people. Um, so we're incredibly happy here. Um, so I, I I didn't mean this to be a ge geopolitical uh, interview, but there must have been a kind of a, an awareness of kind of Kazakh's independence with the with the because the, the, the because of its historic link to the Soviet Union. Um, its proximity to China. Uh, what was the what was the mood when uh, Russia uh, invaded into Ukraine last year? Because um, I know that there were very strong links with Russia, but equally there must have been that sense of crikey, we value our independence as well. Yeah, absolutely, and and the strong links obviously goes goes both ways because Kazakhstan was was used has been used historically as a. Uh, I guess the melting pot, the place where you get rid of people from from Russia, and that's why there's such diverse um, population here today. It, so the the reviews were mixed. I'll say mixed. Uh, you know, you don't meet anyone who is is really for the war. In fact, uh, Kazakhstan's one of the places where lots of Russians have have, have come, you know, to escape mobilization. Um, it's it's mixed because people have been upset. You know, they they have been a little bit worried. Um, you know, in the past as to what it might mean for for the geopolitics of the region. But I think the leadership that's been shown by President Tokayev has been nothing short of absolutely outstanding. I mean, he's, he's walking a tightrope like a master of the diplomatic arts. It really, it's it's a sight to behold. And I think a lot of world leaders could could um, uh, could learn from from how he's gone about that. Um, you know, he the country is Western focused. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, uh, but they're also aware of of their um, historically. Uh, uh, historical um, economic ties to Russia, and of course that you know is decreasing by the day. But the principal pipeline that takes Kazakh oil into Europe goes through Russia, and so you know you obviously need to be very careful with with the way that you play that politics. But he's been adamant that he doesn't support the war. He's been adamant um, not to um, uh, recognise that the the, um, the two separatist states that Russia has, and so on. So I think he's done all all the right things, and you know certainly. Uh, Xi Jinping um, from from China earlier on, uh, you know, relatively early in 2022, came to Kazakhstan as his first international visit after COVID. I think nearly three years, and that says quite a lot. He, he um, you know, he 
what he said was was you know needs to be noted. He he basically stood up and said, you know, we support uh, and we'll do everything in our power to support Kazakhstan's sovereignty, and we think it's um you know at its and its um, geographical borders. That was a pretty big statement, um, and you know. So you've got that from China. You've got obviously um, lots of stuff we could talk about with Russia, and then you've obviously you've, you've got the West, which I think is very supportive of Kazakhstan as well, and the European Bank for Regional Development, the EBRD. It's one of the largest investment jurisdictions for them globally. I think it's about six hundred million last year they put in. So there's a lot of faith that Kazakhstan is a stable jurisdiction from from most parties in the world, and we, we've, we're very comfortable here. And presumably, uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, in the last few years has been very influenced by the China Belt and Road Initiative and perhaps the the, the whatever dip you might have seen of, kind of Western companies, Western investment into a kind of a Russian speaking uh, geographical sphere perhaps didn't affect uh, Kazakhstan so much because of that Belt and Road Initiative or am I um, over interpreting? I mean, I, I wouldn't say it was unaffected, um, you know, but uh, certainly there's a larger longer term uh, picture at play here and everyone's aware of that. Kazakhstan, like a lot of countries which rely on exports to China, uh, Australia is one of them, you know, needs to play that diplomatic um, uh, card, you know, very well as well. So, you know, the investment is fantastic, but you don't want to be beholden to, to <clears throat> excuse me, to another sovereign nation state. And so, you know, there is there is an element of balance that, that needs to be at play there. And, and you know, we, we've even noticed that. And in all honesty, with, with you know, b- before we even started Easter, we'd reviewed over 150 projects in Kazakhstan, you know, private and um, owned by the state and otherwise, you know, did, did quite thorough due diligence. Um, and it was, it was pretty obvious to us that, you know, if two bidders were coming in on the same asset for the same price, there would be a preference to be Western leaning. And, and I think that that is is you know a demonstration of where Kazakhstan wants to go, um, you know, or, or at least certainly wants to diversify their their um, uh, foreign direct investment to, to make sure it's a bit more balanced. Before any investment needs can be made, one of the things you need to do is look at the data. Um, and of course, the the mining industry has been, for various reasons, been shrouded in secrecy uh, between the the major companies as over competition and fear of. Uh, uh, intellectual property theft and then at the national level and minerals have always been viewed as this kind of this strategic uh resource that no one is allowed to look under the you know you're not allowed to lift the skirts or look under the covers of the of the, of the data and I, i've experienced that quite a lot in central asia what's what's your access to data now and is that culture gradually changing or how far has it changed in kazakhstan you know and the, the government's willingness to share data with you Sure. It's it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. So we first started coming here in 2019. And in fact, the mineral law had already changed. So Kazakhstan updated their subsoil law in, in at the end of 2018. And they changed it to one that was based on Western Australia. It's very, very similar to Western Australia. So you, you, you peg a block. Um, it's first come, first serve in areas that have been released by the government. And you get a, a six-year exploration license. Um, and, and anecdotally, people would tell me that the process to get a license before then was, you know, over a year, sometimes two or more years. Um, but now it's 10 days. And I, I can attest to that. You know, we've been through that process. We've, we've received four blocks in 2022 <clears throat> ourselves um, with, with, you know, uh, very little hurdles. So that's the, um, uh, that's the right to uh, obviously explore. But your question was about data. Now it's it, it it is opening up. So there's this huge database. So when you you know the geologists, as you, you mentioned, they covered every inch of Kazakhstan. You know, as they did the USSR, really quite good um, surface mapping and, and a reasonable amount of drilling as well. Um, and someone would write a report, report that would go to the local region. So for example, Uskomenogorsk, and then it would go to the capital, which was Almaty or now Astana, and then it would also go to Russia. Um, so there's three copies of this, but in any one jurisdiction, I haven't been to Russia, but in any of the other two jurisdictions, it, it could be difficult to to get the completeness of everything. Um, so there's an online um, database, for example, that um, you can get a list of all of the available reports, and it's 
good, <clears throat> but it's not complete. So until you get your feet on the ground, you get someone that knows the system and you can send them in. So you send them to Astana, to Casdu Inform. They have the report numbers or the map numbers or the reference and they write down what's available and figure out what they want and or what, what we want as a company. And then you send them to Oscar and Gorsk to do the same thing and you get a compilation of all of the data that might be available and then you purchase that data. Um, and we still have some that they said, no, this is classified, um, which is funny because it's even on a license. They've already given us the economic uh, rights to, to explore. Um, uh, but, you know, now that's even better and you can say, okay, well, now I have to declassify it and you put in the application and it takes a little bit longer, but, but, but the process does work. You know, again, we've been through that. And, um, and when we started in 2019, it would take six months for us to collect data because we were following a process which we understood um, to be the case. And now we're getting reports in, in two weeks because we know exactly which reports we want. We know which pages we want and we order them. And, you know, we've signed all of the document, all of the agreements with CAS, uh, CAS due inform, which, which are sort of the gatekeepers to that data. Um, so horribly slow at the start, very efficient, relatively speaking today. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why we're, we're now, um, you know, conducting an internal mineral resource estimate on one of our licenses because it's a culmination of essentially two years worth of data collection and 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 six months worth of data analysis it, it, it's what the canadians would call breaking trail or, or what i would call the first mover disadvantage you know it's it's uh taken you a while to work out the system and how to how to get it but actually now things are um, moving uh more more smoothly Exactly. Yeah. Thankfully, we, we we've already paid for that disadvantage, Mel. And so, any new investors who come in don't have, they they don't have to pay for a mind learning experience. <laughs> and I, I was quite amused to see that uh, your d discovery announcement from January was uh, it was we've discovered a, a deposit in the database. I mean, it's it's classic mining the archives. I mean, in in a sense, uh, I, I know you did a lot of groundwork in 2022 and did did field work on a number of of, of licenses but uh, a lot of the value has been in mining that archive yeah it well it it hasn't it hasn't been and i've just done uh clear up that that comment so we we referred to a discovery which was from our own drilling but the drilling admittedly was underneath a um uh underneath an artisanal pit um, and you know, I, I'd liken that to, to anything that sort of happens in Africa. I mean, we've, if people are digging up gold, it's a, usually a good place to start drilling. So, so we had surface samples that were, you know, in the thousands of grams per ton. Our RC hole um, hit uh, two meters at 131 grams with disseminated gold either side, um, and so that was what we'd classified as uh, as as a discovery from from that point. But yes, yeah, certainly historic historic data helped. Um, help refine refine that targeting as it always does uh as it does today um now in your presentation you you talk about um i mean very early on uh you the, the you, you list three kind of main project areas you talk about um a rudney altai there's the the vms belt um you talk about uh uh a chu truly a gold belt um truly and then um, East Costano, which is a heavy rare earths play. Um, could you just talk to me about kind of priorities and how you're going to manage the blocks? And um, yeah, just, just just tell me about the, the, the three different areas and what you're doing on them, please. Sure. So, the, the, you know, the strategy when we started, um, I've used this analogy in my presentations that Kazakhstan is Western Australia in the 1970s. Um, you know, someone from our SRK was arguing with me. It was probably more like the 1950s, but you know, I'll, I won't split hairs there. Um, I think that uh, that you know, the reason behind that is is because of its uh, abundance of mineral wealth, because it's actually almost uh, geographically the same size as Western Australia, which is bigger than Western Europe. Um, and now, obviously, the mineral law has changed to, to that of Western Australia. So we had, you know. Um, it, when you have something this big and this exciting, this much optionality, I mean, where do you start? You know, we, uh, I, I can name six or seven just wonderful regions and people know of, of, of different mines there in, in, in various areas where you could look to peg ground. As we were going through, ground was being released. So the whole of the country wasn't available to be pegged and it's, it's still not all, not completely available, but it's more and more um, sort of each year. Um, so so we, had to, we, we had to try and... Uh, get uh, a focus on a couple of areas, but without being 
I guess, too focused on on an area because, uh, like I said, it was optionality and, and exploration is still risky, right? You, you know, um, have to be incredibly lucky to um, you know to drill and de- deposit on the first hole. So we wanted that diversity, um, and we wanted to spend you know some time basically de-risking these projects through our own field work and through um, uh, you know drilling and through historical data analysis. And that was 2022 for us. Um, we, we picked up the heavy rare earth project because one of the founders of, of Discovery Ventures, which was the company that became E-Star um, through an RTO, uh, his name is Dr. Rainer Elmes, and he is, I mean, he's an exploration geologist principally um, based in Namibia with a track record of five or six discoveries. And he discovered the Namibian critical minerals deposit, um, which they're now essentially building, I think, with, with Jogmec, um, you know, going through the final stages. So he's probably what I would consider a rare earth expert um, and in the top, you know, very small percentage of, of people globally that understand these things. So whenever I saw a rare earth project, so I would show it to him and he'd give me his feedback. Um, and so I just did the same for this. I, I said, you know, I, I quite like the counterparty. Tell me what you think. Um, to be fair, I actually said, oh, Rainer, I'm not sure the grades look quite low. And he said, um, Alex, this looks like an ionic clay uh, in South China and you need to take it very, very seriously. So when Rainer tells me to do something, I don't argue with him. Um, I do take it very seriously. And, and so we did uh, a considerable amount of analysis on the historical work um, that was available, which unfortunately didn't involve um, access to any core or any drill samples. But it, once again, if, as we've discussed, it, it did involve quite a considerable database. And when we went and did a site visit, you know, we could georectify all of the drilling and all, but, you know, with the trenches and a couple of borehole casings that were still available. So we were comfortable that, um, that the historic data was, um, had, had a, a reasonable enough degree of accuracy that this was a project worth doing. So what that did for us is it gave us two things. It, it gave us um, a diversity to a, a sector, which as everyone knows, is an incredibly exciting place to be, um, the rare earth sector for, for, for the future. Um, and it also gave us a project which actually had uh, a geologically lower risk than most of the rest of our portfolio because it had this historical um, resource on it. So it was very shallow, um, you know, it's a clay, so it's very simple to drill. And, uh, and we thought that that was a, a, a decision, you know, well worth making um, with, with little to no risk for, um, for East Star shareholders, you know, other than the capital we're spending on it um, to, to, to de-risk it. There was no money out the door or anything like that. And in fact, there won't be. And, you know, there's only a share allocation if, if we continue through with the deal. So that's how we ended up with such a diverse portfolio. Um, uh, but of course, again, through 2022, we've spent um, a lot of money and a lot of time uh, let's say de-risking all of these licenses, and so the priorities are starting to reshape as to how that how our capital is going to be spent in in twenty twenty three. Well, on on that, I mean, and let's stick with the the rare earths. Um, we'll come on to. I, I know it's the third of your. Uh, it, it came in third place on your on your project page in the, in in the um, in the presentation. But just since we've been talking about the Alnet clays and the rare earths, uh, East Costane, uh, what is your plan? for it uh in 20 this year in 2023 well i certainly hope it'll be bumped up in terms of priority i mean i think we're at a stage where where if the the work that we did last year comes back positively you know this is an asset that we could put into um uh convert to joint resource from drilling this year and 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 look at doing scoping studies and and prefees so last year we drilled 30 boreholes uh for just over a thousand meters of drilling and that's a testament to um to the deposit you know it's very very shallow it basically starts at the surface um you know the vast majority of the boreholes i think 27 of the 30 um intersected kaolinitic clay which is exactly what we're looking for um with with an average intersection of about 32 meters so you know we have a nice thick ore body um we have the the host mineral of kaolinite clay which is which is what we want um and then we uh did xrf um uh, which is just a handheld device, X-ray fluorescence, which gives you an indicator um, of of the minerals that are uh, held within that. Yeah, you know, when you shoot it, held within that area. But it only gives you, you know, a surface a surface reading um, of uh, uh, of what's in tail. So we did XRF in all of those, and and we got um, yttrium in, in in all of them. Um, and so that was hugely positive for us because yttrium is a, is a, you know you can use it a little bit as a, as, as a proxy for for rare earths um 
you know, when you're, when you're deciding what samples to send for assay and so on. So we did that, um, really great result. I mean, in, in 12 of the boreholes, we got samples over 500 yttrium. So, uh, 500 ppm yttrium. And for those, I, I won't do it, but for those that want to extrapolate to what that might mean, you know, look at some of our competitors uh, as potential grades there. It's, it's certainly very exciting. Um, it, very, very exciting in terms of those hopeful grades. So, uh, from there, we went to ALS in, in Karaganda. We did, um, uh, all, all of that work. We did sample prep with ALS and, uh, we put together composites where the interim grades were similar and we put together individual meta samples where we needed to, uh, to get a, a fair representation of the ore body that has now gone off and is in ALS in Ireland. And so in any time, I guess in, you know, the coming weeks and months or so, um, we will get those assays back from Ireland at which point we'll report that to the market. And if it is what we believe it to be, then we'll be sending that off for leach test work as well. So the intent is to do a five-stage sequential leach on, you know, a representative sample. And then that'll give us an idea of, of you know, the potential economic, well, I say potential economics, but certainly the process flow sheet. Um, and, and we'll know if we've got a project worth spending considerable um, more time and effort and money on. And uh, it's, is, is the, uh, the link, the leap from a historic non-compliant joke, uh, historic and foreign resource, to a an updated Jork resource is that is is the the the, the path that you need to um, walk is that clearly defined and and is that something you'll you'd be aiming to do yes uh, yes and yes absolutely so I mean it's always up for discussion depending on the type of ore body and um, how homogeneous it is and so on you know usually you could get away with around ten percent and what I mean by that is if you replicate around ten percent of the historical drilling. And it is similar enough uh, to the the modern day assays that you get. Then the remaining drilling, they will say, okay, we can use this borehole data for for conversion to jork. So our, our hope is that that's the case. Um, I got to say, it's not really the end of the world if it's if it's not the case because uh, you know the drilling there is all very shallow. It's actually quite quite cheap um, and easy to do comparatively. So you know, it's really not not. Um, uh, going to set us back in too much in terms of time and money to to repeat the whole thing ourselves. And the other part is is um, when you look at our presentation. So the historical uh, resource was around twenty thousand tons of, of contained um, total rare earth oxides, and that's just this tiny slither of the lysates and and um, the the kaolinite, which is above the granites, um, is is the area that we're targeting. So even just within the initial telluric license is probably about three to four times more um, granites that have not been drilled. And that's a 10 kilometer square license. And we pegged another 137 kilometers, I think, um, you know, to the north, uh, to the northeast along that trend. So, you know, the hope is, is that if the assay results are positive and if the leach test work is positive to say, hey, you know, you could potentially build something economic here, um, then yes, not only would we want to convert a portion to jork so we can start economic studies, but we'd also be um, testing uh, the rest of you know the rest of the granites along strike to to see what kind of potential size we could be talking about. Okay, so I, I, under, I understand it better. So it's it's an alteration of a of, of the the top of the granite. Um, well, Funny enough, we've got we've got lots of that in um, in the UK. It's it's a um, it's famous for its for its uh, clay pits, which form uh, through the alteration of these the, the, these granites. But um, I think you're right in saying that the, the one of the key things is that uh, is, is that metallurgical test work or that first kind of characterization of the mineralogy and the way that this behaves, it, its comportment through various <clears throat> kind of um, uh, process stages, even if it's not a full metallurgical test work, it's kind of a characterization because it seems as if that the it seems as if the 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 mineralogy and the behaviour of these ionic clays is is perhaps the defining characteristic on their economic future. When you've got comfort that there's kind of a um, the, there's a there's a volume and a mass of the material available. That's that, I mean you're absolutely right. I mean um, with with exploration development at each step of the way, you need to um, spend the money as wisely as possible, de, de risking the project appropriately. Um, we could not do the metallurgical test work today, uh, prove there's a deposit there, drill out 
you know, a ginormous resource um, and then worry about the metallurgical test work later, they need to find out that, um, that you know, we've blown a few million dollars um, off a project that might might not actually be feasible from, from a recovery perspective. So, look, you know, we want to do things the right way. You know, we're not here to, uh, you know, to... to to, to sell a concept, we're here to actually find mineable deposits. And well, you said it, but uh, yeah, and it, <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly what I had in my head. So, so you know, we want to do things the right way. We want to spend money wisely. If that means walking away from a project after we spend a bit of money on it, then I, I've got no problems with that. Um, you know, I, I think our portfolio is absolutely outstanding, and uh, and and so I've got no problems, you know, shrinking it. Um, but also I've got a list as long as my arm of things that I would love to do in Kazakhstan. So if it's a matter of building further, uh, you know, the pipeline further, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm very happy to spend time doing that as well. So, you know, let's, let's find out how good these projects are and, and then, and then we'll know, you know, we'll have a really good handle on, and, and we can start to compare ourselves to peers. I mean, our peers have got market caps in the hundreds of millions on, on, you know, similar licenses. Uh, it, we're not that far away, but I, I don't want to do it off the back of uh, of, of being ignorant about the quality. Um, absolutely. So, so uh, just for my sake, wrapping up the East Costanay kind of heavy rare, rare earth potential, uh, you've got a historic resource. It's easy drilling into the to the kaolin uh, clays. You're waiting for the kind of um, the assay data and then the kind of the uh, an an awareness of the metallurgical characteristics or the mineralogical characteristics of this. Um, and this huge runway, um, geologically, you know, that you're not constrained at all. Qu quite the opposite. There's, there's it, if it looks, if the metallurgical characteristics, I'm cautious about saying metallurgical because it's so early. If the mineralogical characteristics suggest that there's a, uh, a kind of an economic potential route, uh, there's no, geological constraints in terms of scale and scope that that's right but you're actually not wrong in what you said before about metallurgical because that's in essence what what we're testing uh, look with within you know defined parameters of course but we are doing a five-stage sequential leach you know we want to find out how easily um the various um uh the various elements leach depending on and and what type of uh, of reagent you know gets those results so so that that is exactly what we're doing. I mean, the the difference is is it's not going to be defined, you know, all the way through to a definitive feasibility study because it'll be eight samples. It's not going to be representative of an entire deposit. Um, uh, but that that's exactly what we're chasing. We want to demonstrate that if this is like South China, kaolinite hosted, a lack of zircon, no uranium and thorium in it, which is what we've seen from the XRF data, from the historical data. So there's no red flags yet. Um, and and now we need to to prove that with the the assays and with the leach test work, um, and if we can do that, then I, then we can move forward and do quite a big program with with you know a lot of confidence, uh, you know a lot of confidence that that um, that we should be able to replicate those results at scale. Good. And um, have you been given a timetable? Are, are are you expecting it in Q one or which we're halfway through or? Uh... Well, actually, two, th two thirds of the way through, um, or Q two. History has 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 told me that promising results from F from labs is uh, is 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 not usually a wise decision. Um, I look, I I, I would love to see them uh, be released in Q one. I would love to get some um, uh, results out to the market, but I haven't got any back today. Um, and so uh, Q two, time will that, tell. That, but yes, I would, them by Q two, um, H one. You'll expect them. In, in the in, in the first half of this year, um, good. Now Ab um, we must yeah, sure. talk about your VMA, um, your, your VMS belt, Rudni um, Altai. You've got, um, or, or do you want to talk about Chui Li, the, the the gold belt? Where, what what what's getting your juices flowing uh, more at the moment? Oh, uh, I Rudni Altai is is nothing short of. Uh, having me wake up quite giddy every morning. So um, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about that. I, you know, I love, I love Chile. I love the potential there. Um, by, by no mean feat is, is that, um, is that done? Um, uh, but certainly origin gold exploration is, is uh, harder and that's a longer term, you know, strategy. Whereas right now, Ty, I'm, I'm feeling very good about it at the moment. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's talk about that. I, I, um, you've got a variety of targets. You've got, um, RA1, RA2, RA3, um, 
Nova two, Nova Nova one. Um, uh, it, it, more, please. Tell, tell me more. Okay. All right. Well, so I, I've got a habit of talking about the exploration, exciting exploration upside first. Um, uh, but I'm I'm trying to teach myself that when you've got um, you know, a priority target that that should be the majority of the conversation. So, so, um, so, so let's start with this. So, RE three, as you mentioned, which is one of the licenses that we pegged last year. The reason why we pegged it later was because uh, in Kazakhstan, the blocks might be available in in what they call Pukafen, which is first come, first serve. But if it's within a kilometer of a village, you need to get a social obligations agreement. Come, um, and we were basically too too busy to you know get our act together to, to do that um immediately you know uh, on listing but it was an area we'd always been quite excited by from a um a high level data perspective um so we did go and meet with with the district chairman and we got our social obligations agreement for three weeks and i can't tell you how you know as an explorer as anyone in the in the mineral game how confident you feel about moving forward when you have a local population that is so unbelievably supportive of what you're doing um and I could talk about why that's the case. So we'll talk about logistics in, in a little while and, and employment and so on. But, you know, continuing on with the asset. So in this data crunching exercise and taking gigabytes upon gigabytes of historical data, um, you know, we finally uh, put, put the team together and had the wherewithal, <clears throat> had the time to uh, allocate all of those resources to digitizing that data and assessing the quality of it. And so that was an exercise that's been um, undertaken really the last six months. And it's it's not culminating, it's still ongoing, but certainly for Fakuba it'll be culminating very soon. So for that particular deposit, um, we digitized around 40, well, more than 45,000 meters of drilling. Um, there's 101 boreholes and we are undergoing an internal mineral resource estimate at the moment. Um, from, from there, we have to, <clears throat> excuse me, from there, we have to decide what we're allowed to talk about from a public markets perspective. And my my inclination or my hope is that we can convert it to a jork exploration target um, because the availability of the data is there in terms of how was the drilling done, how was the logging done, how were the assays um, done. If, if you've got all of that information, then you can release an exploration target because it defines how these results were um uh, were were recovered historically, um, so, so we do have that data. So, so um, on um, on on which prospect is this? So this is called uh, the, what we're calling the Vakuba deposit because it's next to the town of Vakuba. It's just to the east of the town of Vakuba, and it's on the RA three license. Which, if you look at the whole license set, as something that looks a little bit like this, it's in the top right hand corner. It's in the northeast um, northeast corner of the license. Um, it also just so happens that that when we did our um, eight thousand plus line kilometres of Heliborn electromagnetic survey last year, um, came up with thousands upon thousands, obviously of, of of anomalies, but you know they have to be filtered down and so on. Um, with the ones that were good enough, um, uh, sufficiently constrained enough to model as a direct exploration target, we had um, we had well we had five. Um, uh, and th- four of them are in this exact ore cluster, uh, in, in this exact region. So not within the Vakuba deposit itself, but within, uh, I guess what we call the Vakuba ore district. So, so what we have is we have, uh, over a hundred boreholes, um, that we have digitized that we're converting to either a historical mineral resource estimate or an exploration target. Um, and on top of that, we've got lots of exploration upside from additional drilling in the area and from our own derived um, EM surveys. So, like I said, three, four targets um, within that that uh, Vakuba ore district, which has direct direct drillable EM targets, which you know we hope a perspective, obviously, for um, for VMS. So for us, that's you know that's hugely exciting. I mean. The, the drill density of this data, of the historical data, was as such that you can actually put. Um, uh, you can start to put pitch shells on it. Um, and so when you can start to do that, you can start to get an idea of the economics. It'll be at back of the envelope, but still nonetheless very exciting. And when I look at your your map um, on page five of your presentation, you've got some kind of um, uh, uh, resources kind of, uh, or some figures in, in yellow. Are, are those 
historic mines that were mined by the Soviets, kind of things like yeah, um, you've got something it, 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 within within your license area called um, Solonov, um, Solonovskoy. Solonovskoy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so w- what you start off with is, and I could I could do the region and, and shrink it down, but the reason that we are here, the reason we have these licenses, is because what you've got along. You've got the Rudnay Altai VMS belt, which is um, over 500 kilometers long. Just in Russian and Kazakhstan, it's 500 kilometers, like sort of 800 kilometers long through Mongolia and, and China as well. Um, and one to 200 kilometers wide and has you know, over a thousand million tons of ore. It is one of the biggest, most prolific uh, volcanic um, massive sulfide belts in the world. Our part of the belt is is controlled by this um, the, the dotted line through that um uh, uh, through that map that you're referring to called the Urtish Shear Zone. And if you follow that shear zone up, you've got, you know, absolutely stunning deposits like Nikolovskoy, Artemyevsky, Urtishsky, Olofskoy, and so on, men- th- three of which are currently in operation today. And these are, you know, 40, 50 million tonnes at 2.5% copper, 3% lead, uh, you know, a couple of percent, sorry, 3% zinc, a couple of percent lead, over a gram gold, over 40, 40, 50 grams silver. I mean, they're absolutely outstandingly um, good mines and, and high grades. So you know, we, we kind of, um, we did two things. We, we looked at the gap between all those areas um, to say, well, why are there no mines there? And if you look at the um, one to 200,000 scale geological map, it's, it's because it's mostly undercover, almost all undercover. Um, and then the data that we had as well, you know, there's books like Copper Mines of Kazakhstan and so on. The one to 200,000 scale map, they show deposits. Um, so they'll say there is a deposit here. You don't have a lot of data. You've only got a summary. So that one Solonovskoy, for example, is just a summary from, from that report. Um, now, we were sitting on that for, for um, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and, and when we started to focus on exploration in Kazakhstan, uh, it, sorry, exploration in, in Rudnay Altai, we said, okay, we need to actually frame why this is exciting to, to the market. So let's put up just this high level information. But after that, we're not going to talk about individual deposits until they're essentially drill ready. And so even though I am excited by Solonovskoy, I'm excited by Teplushinskoy and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, Rulifunskoy, if I can pronounce these things properly, and a number of other um, areas within the region. Today, the data that we have digitized is for Vakuba. Um, Vakuba very much looks like a mineral deposit. Um, if we can replicate that historical drilling, that will undoubtedly form the framework of our of a of, of development for us um, in this part of the world. And so that's our focus right now. Um, and over the course of... Um, of the coming months and, and year, hopefully we'll we'll convert some of these other targets to draw ready targets and, and you know, we'll be able to talk about some some very, very serious scale. Um, Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I, um, I understand that much better. Um, uh, we, we've had a quite a long chat so far, but let's just um, wrap up with what your work plan is uh, for the year and kind of where the, 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 the your key investments are going in terms of um, time and also budget kind of quarter by quarter if you could certainly so my, my hope is that within h1 will be we'll, we'll kick off drilling the vacuba deposit and the priority em targets um and just as a frame of reference there when we talk about conversion to jaw for historical drilling we should be able to convert uh that with about 10 boreholes which is at the moment planned for around two and a half thousand meters so not a significant drill program at all um, when you talk about putting a, a potentially very substantial, um, uh, certainly certainly for a company our size, very substantial, uh, we hope, um, job resource on, on that deposit. Um, and then, uh, like I said, on top of that, we, we, we intend on drilling these EEM targets because, you know, if we can discover a new high-grade pipe, and as a reference point, and I'm not pretending that this is what we have, but as a reference point, Pokrovsko, which is on our license and mined out, ran at about 25% copper equivalent. So, um, you know, you can start to understand why mines that were running at 1% to 2% copper probably got ignored in that environment, um, you know, when the drilling finished in 1990 as well. So so that is the um, absolute priority or in terms of the data that we have and, and making everything drill ready um, for us. So we have that essentially, uh, that... Um, drill program essentially planned and now we'll go through the tendering process and and um and, and get everything organized for may 
Um, almost all the approvals are in place as well. By the way, you know, a couple of small signatures um, uh, from landholders who have already told us they're ready to sign. So that's not a problem. It's just filing filing paperwork. Um, and then the other one that I, I I hope we will be doing this year because it's subject to the assay results and the leach test work. But I hope we'll be putting a job resource on the um, uh, on the rare earth project as well. So if we can get that data as you suggested in in H1, um, you know mid mid H1, then we'll be planning that exploration program. I think that'll be fairly fast fast to execute in the grand scheme of things. So. Um, you know, it's not unrealistic to say at the end of this year or into early next year, we will have uh, uh, jork resources on two projects. One, copper lead zinc, uh, probably with gold and silver as well, by the way, um, uh, because gold and silver reported into concentrate, even though it didn't appear to be assayed for in the historical assays. Um, and potential molly, because that's also in some mines within the region. But anyway... Um, so, uh, hopefully we'd be converting that to Jork and then therefore could be looking at doing scoping studies and hopefully we could be converting the, um, rare earths project to Jork and therefore be looking at completing scoping studies. If, if everything goes really well and we want to continue drilling, then, you know, we can do uh, a little bit of infill drilling while that's happening. And, and obviously with, with indicated, we can move through to pre-feasibility fairly quickly. Presumably you'll be, uh, wanting to get some kind of runs on the board and get some um, action in the share price and then perhaps going out and raising some more capital. Well, I exactly right. I mean, you know, I, I'm nothing if not protective of my shareholders being quite a significant one myself. So, um, you know, I, I want to be very, very sensible in the way that we allocate our capital. Um, and I want to make sure, as, as you've quite rightly pointed out, we put the runs on the board. You know, we've already done it. We've already demonstrated the value that, that um, we can create off spending money very well. Um, and, and the share market will rewards us for it from time to time. Um, I, I, it can't be it can't be long before it rewards us for it a bit more permanently. So so um uh, so that's what I hope to be doing in the very 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 near future. Uh, my experience is that the London market uh, only gets exploration when it's going well. Yeah, well, uh, potentially the case. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, and and what is well as well? It's always management of expectations, isn't it? Um, you know. We, we, we started our listing and we raised money at 5p and I thought we were, you know, being quite quite cheap at the way we did that as well. It wasn't a very particularly difficult raise. Um, and we had four licenses with some historical data on it, including rock chips. And we've now got um, uh, eight licenses, nine if you include obviously the farming one for Talaric. We've got two that could potentially convert to quite considerable jork resources, you know, within the next 12 months. Um, and we've even demonstrated the potential on our gold orogenic licenses with, you know, quite broad, decent intersections um, and looking at about 10 kilometres of strike on, on Atmintas or, or more. So there's, there's plenty of upside there. Um, some of these licenses, some of these targets will simply require more field work because, before they become drill ready again. Um, and that includes licenses in, in Rudvay Altai. And like I said, there are a number of other targets there. It's not just the, the Fukuba deposit. Um, and so we'd look to do that work throughout the course of this year as well. Alex, thank you very much. Um, good luck with it all. I've really looked forward to uh, seeing the results from that from the metallurgical test work. We can now call it that um, on um, East Cotonou, and uh, seeing how you progress toward drilling um, at Bakuba. Wonderful, Melon. Thank you very much for your time.